um, because we wanted to do something really eye-opening to get the morning going. And the way that we thought about this is that in all of the work I do with companies of various kinds, people like to tell me, everybody likes to tell me, that their company and their industry is the most resistant to change. No question. And they like, have a little eye roll about how their coworkers won't change. It's a whole thing. Um, but in the years that I have been working with companies and, and working on innovative processes with them, I have discovered that there is a sector that is the most resistant to change, and it is education. And that's not because of individual administrators or teachers, many of whom are incredibly passionate, have amazing ideas for implementing change. And in fact, last year we opened the conference with Diane Tavner, who spoke about the work she's doing with Summit Public Schools. And she'll be back this year um, doing a breakout session with an update and some more detail for you. But it was so exciting for people to hear that people were making change in education. And we wanted to do an even deeper dive on that this year. So when you think about the education system that is most resistant to change within education, you've got to start thinking about the New York City Department of Education. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we can represent here. Um, it's tough. And what we really want you to see is that if Lean Startup can make it anywhere, <laughs> can make it there, it could make it anywhere. So we'd like to bring up Stephen Hodes, who works with the New York City Department of Education, to talk about his work with them. Please welcome Stephen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming here. Oh, is this working? There we go. Um, so in, in 2002, Michael Bloomberg became the first mayor of a large city to get control of his public schools. And at that point, the uh, high school graduation rate had been stuck for decades at around 50%. Now, after a decade or so of significant changes in policy and substantial reinvestment, we were able to bring that graduation rate up about 30%, uh, which is pretty good on a national basis. But even towards the end there, those gains had been leveling off, and still one in three of our kids wasn't graduating from high school. So the question is, why does policy change, extensive policy change, only take you so far, and what can you do about it? Uh, in New York, we have a, a problem of scale, right? It's hard to move the needle uh, at scale. It's by far the largest school district in the country. We've got more kids than anybody. We've got more teachers than anybody. We've got 135,000 employees and a $27 billion budget every year. We operate the world's most extensive Wi-Fi network. And every day, we serve more meals than any organization besides the Army. But more importantly, with an organization that big, Changing policy only takes you so far. Changing policy doesn't change how the bureaucracy behaves. It doesn't change its culture or its internalized obstacles, the things that William Blake referred to as mind-forged manacles. Changing policy doesn't change how an organization works. And for that, you also have to change process. Bureaucracies don't change organically. They're rigid structures. They devote most of their energy to fighting change, to keeping entropy at bay, to making sure what stays on the outside of the organization uh, remains on the outside of the organization. And so when they try to solve problems, they tend to do it in ways that look like this. Uh, this is the uh, New York City procurement cycle. And, and procurement is important, we'll come back to it, because it's one of the main ways that districts define and solve their problems. But meanwhile, the rest of the world is increasingly solving problems in ways that look like this. Um, through lean startup methodology, user-centered design, crowdsourcing, all of which are ways of bringing entropy inside the organization to generate change and new ideas, and um, seems to be working pretty well out here. Um, but in a bureaucracy, getting there is hard. Uh, the obstacles are real. The people who run things uh, got their power by supporting the status quo and by resisting change. And they've seen people who want to make change and stir things up come and go, and they're happy to just kind of dig in and, and let you burn out. 
So what are you going to do if you want to make change in an environment like that? Uh, you hear about disruption, but disruption is irrelevant in public education. Uh, the system doesn't have customers. Without customers, you can't have disruption. Uh, there's no market pressure to punish poor performance. There's no underconsumption to exploit. Uh, so without a culture of change and without a fulcrum for your disruptive notions, what are you going to do? So partly to deal with this, a few years back, the mayor, under a previous chancellor, created an office of innovation to function um, as sort of the R&D lab for the system as a whole. And inside of that office of innovation, I run something called Innovate NYC Schools. And I decided that my team, uh, all four of us, would use an MVP process to prototype and validate examples of how the organization could work differently on its problems and think differently about them. And so I, I knew we had to take on procurement because, as I mentioned, um, although most people don't realize it, whether you're a huge bureaucracy or a seed stage startup, the way you define and then test solutions to your problems is the limiting factor on pretty much any change uh, that you might wish to make. And that's why at the DOE, changes in policy don't lead to durable improvements in practice. And it's also why the best and most innovative companies don't want to work with us. And those were both things that I, I wanted to change. So we've been conducting a series of procurement hacks, essentially, very public ones inside the department uh, and in New York City at large. And we've done three of them so far, working with students and teachers and parents and central DOE personnel on issues that are directly relevant to them in their day-to-day -day lives, and then crowdsourcing their idea of the problem to a broad community of problem solvers. And in each of these cases, we've used lean methodology both to innovate on what the DOE does, as well as to iterate and refine our own work. So the first of these things that we did was, was called the Gap App Challenge, which was focused on middle school math. And this was um, no, just a little less than a year ago. And it was the first time that any district anywhere had run a software challenge. And we used it to look at each aspect of the procurement process and recast it. So first, rather than assuming that we knew what the problem was, we spent a month uh, with IDEO doing ethnography with middle school teachers and students and curriculum coaches to understand the problem from their perspective. And then rather than turning that problem into an RFP specification that presumed that we knew what the solution should look like, um, we issued it as a sort of a provocation to the community of early stage ed tech developers and just asked them to give us their own best thinking. Um, and then finally, rather than take the output of that thinking and just kind of toss it over the wall to schools and hope that they used it, we invited the developers to come into our schools and work as collaborators and co-developers with our teachers in real time, in real classrooms over the course of the school year to refine that first product uh, in, in the context that mattered most. Now, typically a regular RFP for something like this would have had maybe six, ten submissions. And I was hoping, because it was a software challenge, we'd have maybe 40 or 50 participants. Um, we had 200 submissions, of which 187 were eligible. We had almost 40 semifinalists. And more importantly, we had 94 classrooms step forward and say they would like to work with those companies to continue the product development. And we had hypothesized that that chance to do the prototyping with, uh, with schools and educators would be the main reason why the companies wanted to participate, why it would drive so much interest. Uh, and that uh, turned out to be true as we went and surveyed uh, the applicants. That prototyping work is something that you would never see in a conventional procurement because it's about iteration. And conventional procurement in most municipalities is hostile to iteration. You say, this is what I want, somebody gives it to you, and then it's done. Um, but you're probably thinking those are kind of like vanity metrics, right? Um, all, those, all those nice numbers. And the answer is, yeah, absolutely they are. Um, because in a politicized, non-market culture, uh, like a school district or another, other municipal agencies, everything you do is a personality co uh, contest. The audience for a challenge like that isn't just the developers and the schools, it's also the people inside of your own organization who are watching you from the sidelines, waiting to see how things turn out. Is it good, is it bad, am I gonna get in trouble? Um, you know, what's the story gonna be? But you know that among those people in any organization are really smart, highly motivated people who are desperate for opportunities to do their jobs differently, but they need a context and they need cover in order to act. And those people are your potential lead users. 
and energizing and freeing those lead users is how you bring about change when disruption is not an option. And so those vanity metrics aren't for your vanity, they're for their vanity. And those metrics, if they work, they provide enough validation within the bureaucracy and create enough of a sort of a safe zone that you get a chance to iterate and do it again. And so um, in August, we approached our Office of Student Enrollment. We have 80,000 kids every year who must choose high schools. There's absolute high school choice in New York. Um, and uh, we wanted to help with this process because it's really important and uh, while the outcomes are good, uh, people hate going through the process. And we wanted to iterate on what we had done with the Gap App Challenge. Um, we wanted, first of all, to do it in a very short period of time. The Gap App Challenge took about six months to get to prototyping and here we gave ourselves 10 weeks. Uh, we wanted to show that you could do it in a very different domain, an unfamiliar domain where the developers didn't know anything about the New York City high school admissions process. And again, we wanted to create one of these collateral sort of Trojan horse benefits. The first time it was the relationships between the developers and the educators. This time it was the opportunity uh, for me to create the DOE's first uh, open API about school data. And so we, needed, we knew we were gonna need a different structure for this rather than an open challenge. And so we created a much more supportive, intimate environment, more like a design charrette. Uh, for which we selected six companies to participate. And we really just kind of wrapped our arms around them, gave them access to our user research. We brought in administrators to explain the business logic to them. We hosted discussions for them with behavioral economists and marketers and the founders of Etsy and Kickstarter uh, and people working in OkCupid to help them understand how people make choices, um, of which school choices is just one example. And so um, after about eight weeks, um, we were able to demo six apps that are now available for anybody to use. Each of them is really different from the other. They all take a different approach. There's no one best. The functionality is, is really deep. Um, and the API that we built as kind of the sideline Trojan horse is now open and will stay open for other developers to build new functionality against and we'll continue to add to and, and push more data through it. Um, the, the best validation that we had for this process was the CEO of one of the companies, uh, Find the Best, which is based out here. They do consumer comparison choices. Uh, he was quoted in an interview as saying that the app that he built for us was the best product they'd built in the four years that they had been building things. And that was a huge piece of data for me to take back into the DOE that companies might want to work with us, not because we'll make them money, but because we'll make them better. That really changes the way the organization thinks about itself. We're in the midst of our third iteration right now in which overall we've challenged the bureaucracy to challenge itself. Um, encouraged by the work that we were able to do, the chancellor, who's the version, our version of superintendent, invited each division in the DOE to submit proposals for products or processes that they wanted to improve. We got 11 proposals, fascinating proposals on topics ranging from busing to school lunch to chronic absenteeism to data dashboards to student wellness. All of these were ideas that people doing the work every day had had, right? We gave them three days to turn around the applications. There was this pent-up demand for doing new stuff and doing it in new ways. And we're in the research phase now, going out and talking to users um, of all kinds, and we'll start prototyping these solutions uh, in a couple months. Um, Seth Godin says that if you want to make durable change in an organization, you need to do two things. You need to increase alignment and you need to decrease fear. And in a certain sense, that's what all of our work uh, has been about. I've been doing this for about a year now and um, what have we validated? Basically, I think that, that in a large bureaucracy, you can use lean methodology to create catalytic examples of people doing differently and thinking differently and valuing different things. Uh, we've learned that user-centered design and crowdsourcing are powerful ways to reorient the way that a bureaucracy thinks about its work and function as bait for those lead users that are, uh, exist throughout the organization. That's the increase alignment part. Uh, but also that the success of each of those examples creates a safe space for the pent-up energies of other lead users to drive change inside their own silos and that those in turn create very powerful second and third order effects that's decreased fear. Um, and uh, we validated that even in the largest, most obstinate organizations, it's possible to introduce a little entropy, bring the outside in, create better processes, better products, and smarter demand. Thanks.